The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. Okay, let's go. Why did the U.S. go to war in Iraq? In the early stages of military operations. Growing up, the narrative was always oil. So it's like we went to Iraq to get oil, like America always does. We might find ourselves without adequate supplies of energy in the future. All major oil fields in the South are now under coalition control. But that's kind of the lazy explanation. It's not quite it. Oil's a part of it, but it's not the main reason. We went to war in Iraq because several powerful American men wanted to. Some of them thought it was vital, we had to. Others just wanted to project American power. But either way, here we are 18 years later, nearly 10,000 Americans dead, over 200,000 Iraqis dead, over a trillion tax dollars spent. And the result? So what was the result of that 20 year war in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, like nothing? And basically that area of the Middle East is more unstable now than it was then. I mean, seriously, think about that. Plus, how many trillions of dollars were spent being recycled through that military industrial complex we've talked about? And how many, I mean, honestly, millions of of innocent lives were lost. You know, civilians, Iraqi civilians, U.S. US uh, soldiers. Anyway, so today we are going to do a couple things. And really the main thing is, you know, what, what I'm understanding is that, God, history really does repeat itself. And sometimes you look back on other situations that have happened and it almost does feel like, like it's a playbook. And it feels like, you know, it's history repeating itself, but also that, you know, the, the script is being followed again. And so, you know, I wanted to do this for a while. This is another one of these episodes that I've had on, had on my radar for a long time to do. And it's really just to kind of dive in and understand what the heck happened in Iraq. And really it, 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 again, it's all about oil put a focus on people like George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld and the neoconservatives. But that war wouldn't have been possible if it didn't have the backing of some of the most elite figures of the Democratic Party. And what I would argue is that the U.S. policy on Iraq, not just uh, from Clinton to Bush to Obama and beyond, has been consistent, but that it's been consistent for six decades through 11 presidents. Uh, This is a history that's included covert CIA operations, regime change, support for Saddam Hussein, and a merciless policy of targeting the Iraqi civilian population. So one thing a lot of people probably don't know about Iraq is it absolutely is one of the world's biggest oil oil producers. So here are like the top seven oil producers in the world. United States, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Canada, Iraq. So Iraq is number five. China, United Arab Emirates, and Iran. I think Iran actually should be higher up there, but it looks like these numbers are a little bit skewed because of the sanctions that that take place in Iran. So I would probably put Iran in maybe the top three or four. But again, Iraq is in the top five. It's in the top five or six oil-producing countries in the world. The latest Middle East crisis, perhaps the most menacing of all, has flared up in Iraq, a country that produces over 30 million tons of oil a year. In this picture, King Faisal is at Kirkuk with his uncle, Crown Prince Abdul Ilah. In 1958, Iraq was ruled by a British-backed monarch named King Faisal. And basically, Iraq just served the interests of Western capitalist countries because they were all able to come in and freely take Iraq's oil. And you had a phenomenon of rural poor, great poverty, and wealth was concentrated around basically British interests. And there was a uprising that began on uh, July 14th, 1958, and it was led by an army brigadier general named Abdel Karim Qasim. Uh, And that rebellion very quickly overthrew the monarchy of King Faisal. By the way, I'm finding all these clips and footage on TikTok. How crazy is that? I mean, again, I'm not 
a hundred percent in on TikTok. I know there's probably a shade factor to it, but that is pretty nuts. That research, you know, from that's what, that was an Associated Press story from 1972 that went all the way back to 1958. It's like a black and white clip. It was pretty amazing. But I found that on TikTok. I mean, that's that's insane. So basically where we're at with this is, you know, again, Iraq started kicking butt when it comes to oil. And so they overthrew the the monarchy that was basically playing ball with with England. England, man, England is like they're the they're not good. They're really not. And they wanted to take back their oil and nationalize their oil. And so they started doing that. As a result of its oil reserves, the economy rose rapidly. In 1972, the country nationalized its oil industry, thereby pocketing more of the profit. A year later, oil prices boomed in the aftermath of the 1973 oil crisis, and Iraq, like many other OPEC members, benefited tremendously. Saddam sought to mollify and bring stability to Iraqi society by using this money to improve services for ordinary people. At the time, what Iraq was offering its citizens was extraordinary and found few parallels across the Middle East. Saddam supervised the national infrastructure program which saw the construction of schools, roads and hospitals. Iraq's public health system became a regional leader as healthcare was made free, a feat that earned Saddam an award from UNESCO. All right, so here's what's interesting. So Iraq in the 70s, let's say 1970 to 79 or 80, you know, again, it was all about oil, very similar to Iran. It seemed like the leader and then, you know, Saddam Hussein came into power you know, based on all of that, you know, they were doing right by their people. They were definitely building up the country, building up their infrastructure. And at that time in the 70s, there was there was no problem with Iran. Iran and Iraq were totally cool. It wasn't until 1980 when that war broke out. And then even that war, you know, the United States funded Saddam in that war because they were basically funding them against the Ayatollah and the revolution that had taken place in Iran. And so what's fascinating is that for those 10 years from like 1980 to 1990, the United States was funding Saddam Hussein and they were basically on his side until he kind of wanted to take over Kuwait. So here's the parallel and here's what I talked about at the beginning which, you know, is like history repeating itself and and the playbook. And I'm going to get into this in an episode later this week. But, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu basically funded Hamas. He funded Hamas in like 2014 to 2000, almost 19, 2020, because he did not want the Palestinian Authority, which is the governing body of the West Bank, He didn't want the Palestinian Authority to get too strong in order to then unite the West Bank and Gaza. And so, you know, again, it's the parallels are are, are there, you know, and and it makes me think, you know, there is sort of a playbook to all of this stuff. And later this week, when we go into the Netanyahu and Hamas stuff, I think it'll be interesting to think back on you know, what the United States did with Saddam Hussein and then, you know, changed course. And then now you're looking at Netanyahu, you know, obviously changing course or having to change course because of, you know, the the monster that it created or the entity that he helped create in terms of Hamas. All right. So now we are getting into the year 2000 and remember the petrodollar. And then this happens. In November of 2000, Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. In response, the U.S. government, with the assistance of the mainstream media, began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. 
All right. So this was the beginning of all of that stuff. And it was the United States and England. Remember, the 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 the, the bosom buddies conjoined twins. And so it was George W. Bush and this wanker, British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Should terrorists obtain these weapons, now being manufactured and traded around the world, the carnage they could inflict to our economies, our security, to world peace, would be beyond our most vivid imagination. My judgment as Prime Minister is that this threat is real, growing, and of an entirely different nature to any conventional threat to our security that Britain has faced before. That was year 2000. Now fast forward to last week. So obviously we're doing everything in our power to achieve two things. One, destroy Hamas, because without it, none of us have a future. And it's not only our war, it's your war too. It's the battle of civilization against barbarism. And if we don't win here, this scourge will, will pass. The Middle East will, will pass to other places. Middle East will fall, Europe is next, you'll be next. My judgment as prime minister is that this threat is real, growing, and of an entirely different nature to any conventional threat to our security that Britain has faced before. There's definitely parallels in what took place, you know, with 9-11 and then what took place with October 7th. And again, you know, the funny thing is they kind of were not even trying to disguise that. I mean, I think in one of the initial episodes that I talked about, you know, I brought up 9-11 and, and then I was like, hey, that's not my, those aren't my words. Everybody's talking about it. And then subsequently, I mean, it kind of became the calling card. It really became the calling card. It was almost like, hey, they're not, they're not making the connection. Let's just start talking about it outright. And that's what they've done. You know, they've totally started just obviously talking about 9-11 and then October 7th as, you know, Israel's version of that. So again, you know, this was the beginning of talking about the weapons of mass destruction and, oh, hey, they've got this stuff. We've got to we've got to go find them, because if we don't, it's going to, you know, it's going to be the end of us all. Next, they had to find Iraq's brutal dictator, Saddam Hussein, and disarm him of his weapons of mass destruction. There was one problem, though. Saddam didn't have any. All right, so the one thing I want to point out now, and this is going to be a little bit of a prediction. We'll see if this comes true or not. You know, the one difference right now with this whole Hamas situation and then, you know, the 9-11 stuff or any of that stuff with Afghanistan and Iraq is, you know, there always was the anti-hero. There always was the focal point, you know, the villain. And it was Saddam Hussein. It was Osama bin Laden. You know, right now it's kind of like, Hamas, quote unquote, is is that entity. And I don't know, that's a little hard to grasp. I think that's a little hard to grasp for people. So I'll be very curious if as this plays out, I don't want to put a time limit on it or a time frame on it, but I'll be very curious if somebody comes out as sort of the 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 uh, what's the word i guess i guess anti-hero or the focal point of hamas so it no longer is just being referred to as hamas but like you know referred to as the leader of hamas and then that person takes on some notoriety you know obviously like saddam hussein did and osama bin laden did the security of the world requires disarming saddam hussein now all right. So, you know, I've wanted to cover that and wanted to kind of, you know, lay that foundation about the story of Iraq. And obviously oil was a was a giant part of, you know, everything there. And then I am going to play for you guys a little clip. This has been circulating, definitely not in the mainstream side of things, but it's been circulating kind of in the the underbelly, you know, places like Joe Rogan, Patrick Bet David, Russell Brand, Jimmy Dore, you know, guys that, again, I mean, these dudes do their research and they have teams looking at stuff. So 
you know, you do have to, you do have to put a little bit of, of, of credibility into, you know, what, what they're talking about, but give this a listen. This is new scoop that I have yet to introduce. You probably wouldn't know it, but Gaza is rich, the gas rich, at least 1.4 trillion cubic feet rich to be precise. But there's a catch. Geologists and natural resources economists have confirmed that the occupied Palestinian territory lies above sizable reservoirs of oil and natural gas wealth in Area C of the occupied West Bank and the Mediterranean coast off the Gaza Strip. To date, the real and opportunity costs of the occupation exclusively in the area of oil and natural gas have accumulated to tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars. All right, I'm going to end that there because I'm doing more research on that. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of scuttlebutt as they say, talking about how natural gas and oil reserves have, I don't know if it's recently discovered, but maybe they're finally ready to be tapped or because of kind of what's going on with, you know, the natural gas situation with Russia and the Nord Stream pipeline, which by the way, deep shallow dive coming up on the Nord Stream pipeline, you know, maybe, maybe the time is now to pull the trigger on, you know, leveraging the natural gas and then oil that is in Gaza and, I will say this, I will say this, what has been interesting about all these stories is that they've all talked about that gas, that natural gas being in northern Gaza. And so that, you know, does support why there's been such a focus on the Israeli side of bombing northern Gaza and driving the people out of northern Gaza into southern Gaza. You know, I originally thought that 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 was you know, part of the plan to drive them from the north to the south and then from the south, just drive them all the way out of Gaza into Egypt. But if there is something going on with natural gas and oil in northern Gaza, that definitely makes sense. And and it makes a lot of dollars. (laughs) That's funny. It makes sense. But more importantly, it makes a lot of dollars. All right, I'm going to end this one here. It's only about 18 minutes, but I thought this was a pretty heavy topic, so I don't want to overload things. It is something I wanted to talk about. And, you know, I would just say use this all as just a backdrop, you know, just a backdrop to understand that, you know, 20 years ago things happened 50 years ago, things happened. 75 years ago, things happened. You know, this is not a new phenomenon of there being, you know, geopolitical, not only tensions, but just fuckery, for lack of a better word. Sorry about the, uh, sorry about the F-bomb there. But anyway, just use this as a backdrop. I'd ask you to just keep your mind open to, to, to anything being possible. And again, for, you know, I want to stress this again. I don't view this as any country doing this. I view this as a subset of people within these countries doing things. So that's about it. Everybody call a spade a spade. We'll talk to you tomorrow. This episode was brought to you by Boost Liquid Vitamins. Wake up, take your boost, start your day. Drink your vitamins, build your immune system with Boost. Available on Boost.com.